Are you ready for battle? Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring <coughs> lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. <coughs> Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. Mark shared Psalm 46 with us this morning about the battle that rages on and, and the fear that wells up inside of each and every one of us. And there's an, there's an incredible verse, and you've probably seen it, you've heard it probably uh, a thousand times in your life, and it's Psalm 46, verse 10. Because in the midst of the battle, as it rages on around you, there is this command that goes so completely against any of our nature, and it says this, be still. And know that I am God. And then it's followed up with this truth. Okay. I will be glorified. I will be glorified. And just pause and confess to you for a moment as a pastor, as your pastor, that the tragedies of this week have been some of the hardest that I've ever walked through as a pastor. And I could not be more proud of who we are as a church, the strength, the resiliency in the midst of the battle, how my heart longs to gather together with you and to sing God's praises and to to hit our knees and just pray together and in this moment to be still and know that he is God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter six as we will finish the book of Ephesians today. You should have gotten uh, an armor of God Summary prayer card for you to take home with you and to have at your disposal. <clears throat> as well as I hope you notice that there are Bibles in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, if you do not have a Bible, please take that as a gift from us. There are also notepads for you to take notes that are always there for you. I could not think of a better sermon passage for the life of our church uh, really to conclude uh, the walk through Ephesians over the past almost year. But this truth at this day, really it's the final piece of armor as you put all of these things together, even though it's not a specific piece of armor, it is the final instructions, and that is pray. Amen. Pray. So listen as I read Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak, but that you may also know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren. And love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Will you pray with me? 
King Jesus, we know that you are with us. We know that you meet us in your word. We know that you inhabit the praises of your people. We know that you bid us to come before your throne and to seek your face. And shall we seek in vain? No, the truth of the matter is that when we seek you, we find you. And we are gathered together this morning as your people around your word to hear your voice. Would you be the lifter of our heads? Would you prick our hearts? Would you heal us? Would you encourage us? Would you give us the strength to press forward? Would you give us the faith and the confidence and the reminder that you will be glorified and your name will go to the ends of the earth? We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul has spent the last three years in chains because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. His freedom has been stolen. But the Lord has allowed incredible moments of testimony where Paul was actually able to stand before governors and kings and declare the truth of Jesus Christ. But if we're honest and you pause and think about it, those moments have been few and far between in comparison to the day-in, day-out trial of sitting in a jail cell where his freedoms have been stolen. Pause for a moment and think about Paul's ailing body. He walks with a noticeable limp. His back is scarred beyond comprehension. Five times he has received 39 lashes from the Jews because he would go into synagogue and proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ. Three times he was beaten with rods and one time he was stoned. Put yourself in your mind's eye in one of those situations. You realize they do not stop stoning you until they think you are dead. Certainly his head and face are scarred from that incident. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says that he cried out to the Lord because he had a thorn in his flesh, some sort of physical ailment, and he prayed that the Lord would take it away. Theologians have speculated that it was, it was possibly his poor eyesight. It was, it was possibly that he dealt with epilepsy or it was possible that he had severe complications from malaria. Whatever the case is, Paul knew that God was able to heal. And so on three different occasions, he hit his knees and begged for the Lord to remove this thorn in the flesh. But God's reply was, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. In addition to Paul's physical ailments, he has enemies. A number of Jewish leaders had made assassination attempts upon his life, even taking vows that they would not eat until it was carried out. Furthermore, we find that in addition to the constant weight of caring for a persecuted church, that there are enemies within the church who have pressed back against Paul. You can read about that in the first chapter of Philippians. 
Most likely the scenario is that they are upset with Paul because he appealed to Caesar and because Paul has been filled with boldness all along and it is causing further and further persecution for the church. They are saying, Paul, would you stop being so bold? It's causing so much heartache because the battle continues to rage on and Paul feels the weight of that. You see, the pressure is mounting. His suffering is long. And by the time Paul stands before Caesar, he will be deserted by all. He will give account solely in the strength that Jesus Christ provides because all have deserted him. You see, the last time that Paul spoke to the church in Ephesus, he had in boldness declared that he was ready to lay down his life, to even die for Jesus Christ, to give account, to give testimony. But as he sits day after day after day in chains, waiting, contemplating what is to come, you see, he is only human. I think so often, just like we do with Jesus, we kind of count Paul as a super spiritual, super Christian. And we fail to put ourselves in his shoes and to see the complexity and the depth of this trial that he sits in. Because here in a moment, as we as he closes out his letter, you see, he prays for boldness. You say, well, well, Paul, you're you're always bold. What's that? No, no, no. Listen to me, church. He He is in the midst of absolute battle, absolute difficulty, fighting day in, day out, and he pauses here to pray because he covets. He is begging for the churches to pray for him in the midst of that, that he would, that he would not, that he would not uh, uh, cower to save his own neck. He is tempted just like you and I would be in the midst of that battle. He is praying. He says, I covet your prayers for, for boldness because, because I need to speak the truth of Jesus Christ as I ought to. You see, he is tempted to shortcut the gospel with all the cultural pleasantries and none of the sticking points. And so he writes in verse 19, pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You see, this is a prayer of faith. It's a crisis of faith, and he knows the answer. And he says, pray that I remember who I am. Pray that I remember who I am. This world is not my home, and I am an ambassador. I am living in a foreign country, and I am so tempted to to shrink back when that moment comes, but pray that I have boldness as an ambassador, that I proclaim the gospel because he is so worthy of it. He is so worthy. I mean, how convicting, right? When you read your Bible and you see that, that here is Paul with his life in the balance saying, pray that I would have boldness to not shrink back, but to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. Talk about convicting for us. 
as we walk through our lives and our circumstances. Our lives are not in the balance. We should be filled with strength and courage. When was the last time you prayed for boldness? To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ as he is worthy of. You see, this is the personal context behind this amazing letter that we've been walking through for close to a year now. This is the personal context behind it. We don't know how long it took Paul to write this letter, but I want you to think in your mind's eye about about weeks, right? He is praying through every movement of the letter, knowing that, that God is going to use it mightily. And at some point, as he is sitting there in chains, uh, in this context, and he's charging Christians, right? As he did halfway through the letter to put off the old self and to put on the new self. At some point as he's sitting there, he sees a Roman guard. They are dressed in full armor. And his mind begins to race. And God has allowed him to see that our battle is is not just against flesh and blood. And his mind begins to race as as he is trying to think about how to communicate in this letter. And he remembers the book of Isaiah. He remembers how in the midst of the battle, how God the Father looked down and realized that 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 a savior was needed. And in the book of Isaiah, the the savior renders the heavens and comes down and wins the battle and wins the victory. And there's Paul in in his jail cell and the Holy Spirit begins to stir up in his mind and in his emotions and say, yes, yes, that's exactly right. That, that savior who came down in Isaiah, that was King Jesus. Jesus coming down and, and, and saving us, doing, uh, all for us that we could never do for ourselves, accomplishing the salvation of God. But it doesn't stop there. Paul's mind races because because King Jesus didn't just save us. He is now offering us his armor. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And Paul, looking at this Roman soldier, stirred up by the power of the Holy Spirit, then begins to to realize and begins to exclaim about how important it is, dear Christian, that the battle is not just over with Jesus, but you and I are called to put on the armor. We're called to put it on. And we've been walking through for the past seven weeks, piece by piece of the armor, Right? And, and, and like Tony Stark in Iron Man, we've been learning how to just call it to ourselves and, and, and you're just formed up in battle. Okay? And, and we've been walking through this piece by piece, understanding the absolute importance of it. And now in your mind's eye, I need you to think that you are all armored up. You as a Christian soldier are ready for the battle. Remember, this is a hand-to-hand combat. Think ancient warfare, right? In my mind's eye, I always think of Braveheart, right? It's my favorite movie. And and you just think of the the battle lines. uh, uh, All the the armies are lined up one across from each other, and you're you're armored up. And and just as the, the battle is about to begin, there's this famous scene where William Wallace comes out, and he gives the charge to the troops, right? Uh, just FYI, I, I once memorized that speech and, and gave it to my team in paintball, all right, so that we would charge the field, right? And he ends that whole, he ends that whole talk with, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. You just get ready to charge into battle. 
So think of that scene. Think right there in your mind's eye. There we are. We're armored up. We are, we are the people of God. We're the army of God. It's right there. But catch this right at the time, right at the moment where you think William Wallace gives that speech. And then, and then like crazy men, they just run as fast as they can and crash into the other one. And you're like, this is horrific. This is a terrible battle plan. All right. But as you think about that in your mind's eye, Paul does something unique and different, not what you would expect. Because right at that moment, the Christian soldier hits his knees. The Christian soldier hits his knees. Paul does this dramatically because he wants not one iota of confusion it is unmistakable that Paul wants you to know and understand that the Christian soldier is 100% dependent upon God and upon prayer. That this is not in your strength. This is not about you putting on God's armor and then you just run out there like a wild man and nothing can happen to you, but that you are 100% dependent upon Jesus Christ at all times. Prayer at its core is nothing more than you and I saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. How can I face a spiritual enemy that I can't even see? What do I know about spiritual warfare? King Jesus, this is your armor. I need you. Don't for a second think that you and I are ever called to walk out in our own strength. I need you. So whether you and I this morning see this as how to put on the armor, that we pray on the armor, or whether we see it as the, the prayer is, is the gas inside the engine of a car or the electricity that makes it all work, uh, it matters not. The importance is that you and I understand that without prayer, nothing in the Christian life works. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times. Be on the alert. You see, there's an unmistakable urgency to pray because the battle rages on. And so many are completely unaware that they are slowly sinking in the quicksand of darkness. I'll never forget something that John Piper said about prayer. It's stuck with me and I'll pass it along to you. He said, prayer, particularly the petitions of prayer, that is when you ask God for something, prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie. You are in the midst of the battle. You are hunkered down in a foxhole. And you are desperate for, for air support. And you call upon your heavenly father. You say, the battle is raging on. I cannot press on. I need you. I need you to fly in. I need you to do what only you can do, King Jesus. That is the purpose of prayer. But so many of us view prayer as a hotel intercom where we buzz down and say, I'd like a cheeseburger. Hold the pickles. And we wonder why there's no power whenever all we do is petition God for personal preferences and comfort. James 4, 3 says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Or when we have a lack of prayer life because we say, I don't really need anything from God right now. There is scarcely a question to humble us more than how's your prayer life? Now, I genuinely believe that along with the disciples, that every one of us wants to know more on how to pray. 
We don't want to fall asleep. We don't want to have wandering minds. We, we don't want to feel like our prayers don't reach above the ceiling. But the primary reason is that we have missed the purpose of petitioning God for prayer is that we are in the middle of a war, not personal preferences. It is for kingdom advancement. Is this not how Jesus taught us to pray? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Secondly, we see here that Paul reminds us or he charges us with prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. You see, the opposite of petitioning God for our pleasures is praying in the spirit. So what does it mean to pray in the spirit? Well, Romans 8, 26 and 27 says that the Holy Spirit of God, when you and I don't know how to pray because we are so overwhelmed by the battle at the moment, that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Now, that is an incredible truth. That is a hallelujah, praise God. But what is being talked about here is even more than that. Because what is being talked about here is the fact that you and I are called to be active in prayer. So prayer in the spirit here is active of Christians. Amen. So what does it mean? Well, I think it means at least two things. When you piece Romans 8 and Jude 20 in this passage together, I think it means at least these two things. First, is that when the Holy Spirit prompts your heart to pray, the Holy Spirit prompts the Christian's heart to pray. Look, you were dead in your affections to God until the Holy Spirit came and woke you from the dead and gave you a heart that beats for him and has affections for him. And the Holy Spirit will come and will continue to stir up affections and a desire for God. It is your responding to those Holy Spirit promptings in prayer. Many times the, the Holy Spirit will prompt you and, and call scripture to your mind. I think you should pray through those scriptures at that moment. Many of you and myself included had had a number of experiences where, where, uh, where suddenly I'm, I'm reminded of someone from my past. Someone's, someone's memory just immediately pops into my mind. And I try and make it a habit right there in that moment to pray for that person. Because, because I genuinely sense that that is a Holy Spirit prompting and I'm going to pray for them. I may not even know the circumstance, but I'm going to pray for them. George Mueller was once asked, because he had been praying for two people for more than 50 years, if he ever got discouraged when praying for them. To which his reply was, well, do you think the Holy Spirit has had me praying for them for that long and he's not going to save them? Both of them were saved. One of them right before Mueller's death and one of them shortly after. Secondly, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? is allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and empower your prayers, right? So Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, your will be done, which is an attitude of saying, Holy Spirit, guide me when I pray. If you guide me, I will be obedient to follow. I'm not going to plow through prayer as if it is some routine, as if you are not a person for me to encounter. I will wait. I will learn to listen. I will learn to pray your heart's desire, not mine. So I think that's what it means, at least those two things, to pray in the Spirit. Number one, Holy Spirit promptings, and number two, being guided by the Holy Spirit in prayer, and that we do that in faith. Listen, there, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. One is that you would sit there, and you would just sit there and do nothing and go, Spirit, are you going to tell me something? And just wait and do nothing until then? Or... 
ditch on the other side of the road is you are just doing your thing, you're gonna plow through and you're not gonna listen no matter what. There's a balance in those, in the Christian life. And you do this in faith. Now catch this, here's the incredible promise that when you and I as believers pray in the spirit. Listen to 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked of him. Now that should stir our hearts out of slumber and stir us up to pray. That when we are led by the Holy Spirit of God, we know that he hears us and that we have the request that we ask of him. Urgency in prayer. Pray in the spirit. And thirdly, we see he says, and make petitions for all the saints. And make petitions for all the saints. Here's the fact of the matter. We need each other. We need each other. We need each other in prayer. Think of this battle formation that you see. We, we had walked through the armor of God. We had walked through even hiding behind the shield of faith in our own life. But here's the truth of the matter. is a real battle formation. Is that you link your shields together. Is that you do not stand alone, but you stand right next to your partner, to the right and to the left, and you are linked arms together. Not in isolation. Hear me, do you know what happens to a soldier who wanders off in isolation and tries to battle everything by himself? The devil is constantly wanting you to hear that you are alone, that the trials and temptations that you are going through are unique. They are one of a a kind, that no one cares for you. It is not true. It is a lie from the pit of hell. You are not alone. We need each other in prayer. I felt that so incredibly this week. In the midst of the battle, in the midst of the darkness. Guys, there's a reason as your pastor, I'm always begging you to get plugged in to a growth group, to get plugged into a smaller group of of people that know you and are going to walk through the battle with you. Because when, when everything's fine and you're good, but you don't know when the, when the flaming arrows and the trials of life are going to come. Every one of us is one phone call away from having our entire world fall apart. And you need to get plugged in so that when the storms of life hit, you have a battle formation that's going to pray for you. I asked for permission to share this story recently, and I could share many. Rob and Kathy Bozan have been going through a tremendous trial. Their, their son, Aaron, has been battling cancer, and it's, it's required all hands on deck for grandparents to go and to, and to fly and to be there uh, to help and to support. The, they have really young grandchildren, and so just being there and, and even that trial has stretched out into to weeks and weeks and then, and then months of, of being there in the midst of this really difficult situation. And let me just tell you how awesome their growth group has been to pray for them faithfully. I mean, I show up week in, week out and just get tapped on the shoulder. And, hey, we're praying for them, pastor. We're praying for them, pastor. And there was a critical moment in the midst of this trial when Rob and Kathy, they, they just called me and they just said, we need some, some prayer time with our pastor. And praise the Lord for cell phones because I was sitting in my office and they were off on the other side of the country. And they just began to, to weep and to confess about the weariness of the battle. And, and 
in the sense at that moment that they were, that they were struggling to make it through. And all I can tell you is in the midst of that prayer time, the Holy Spirit showed up in an incredible way, in an incredible way. And all three of us and others would would look back at that moment and on the prayers of the growth group, would look back on that entire situation and would give 100% credit to God and to the power of prayer. And I could get 20 more stories just like it. Now let me take this a step further. And can I just tell you that the Lord has been convicting me deeply about our need to gather together and to pray corporately. To have prayer services. I have never felt the presence of the Lord the way that I sense him with us here at First Baptist Bernie. I've been in a number of churches. I've served on staff and two others. I've been the pastor of other churches. I'm telling you, I've never sensed the power and the presence of the Lord as when I do when we are gathered together on Sunday morning. And God has been pressing me about our need to pray, to get in that battle formation and pray. And so I want you to circle your calendars because on November 14th at 5 p.m., we're gonna have a night of prayer. And the end, I mean, we're gonna sing a couple songs, but that hour is gonna be dedicated towards prayer and praying on the armor of God. Praying it on. And if you need prayer for your marriage, if you have a a prodigal child, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for your job and provision, for direction in life, we're just going to meet together and we're going to spend time together in prayer. Because the reality is, is the battle rages on. And it's very good for you and I to gather on Sunday morning, to sing his praise, and to gather around God's word. But the people of God need to spend time in prayer. So as we conclude the book of Ephesians, and you have that snapshot in your mind's eye about where Paul is and the way that he writes and the way that he charges the people of God. I, I had this thought for the first time preparing this week, thinking about the armor of God. And it was Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. And what I find so magnificent, Jesus prays in the garden and it is intense beyond anything that has ever occurred on the planet. And what I always marvel at is that afterwards, after the garden, you don't even see one hint of Jesus wavering after that. I think he prayed on the armor of God. That he surrendered to God's will and that he was covered in the armor of God. Now, Don't you think, well, that's just Jesus. He's awesome. He is awesome. With the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, Paul prays earlier in Ephesians, I pray that you would know and understand the power that's available to us as his. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, where else can we go but you? There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. It is you, King Jesus. You hold the words of truth and life. And your word calls us to be still and to know 
that you are God. And your gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Help us to rest. Give us your rest. Heavenly Father, I know all across this room there are hearts that are heavy. Father, fill them. Be the lifter of their head. Allow them to hear your voice. Allow them to see that Jesus Christ is seated on the throne. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.